Determination comes in many forms, but always starts with a Dunkin' Run. So take your medium or larger coffee in one hand and grab a dollar donut in the other. No matter how you run, Dunkin' Run. A one dollar donut with any medium or larger coffee. Excludes specialty donuts and fancies. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Terms apply. 92% of households that start the year with Peloton are still active a year later. All because of a fancy bike? It's not just a bike. Peloton makes treadmills, too. Eh, all treadmills are the same. Our treadmills can adjust speed and incline automatically, so you never break your stride. Whether you're squeezing in a power walk or training for a marathon, Peloton can help you achieve your fitness goals. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try the Peloton Tread risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. With no permanent residents, violent crime in Antarctica is very low, but low doesn't mean zero, and the mysterious death of Rodney Marks is thought by some to be one of the only murders on the continent. I'm Charlie, and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to Crime Lines and this day's installment of the 12 Days of Crime Lines. I ended up getting sick halfway through this series. Luckily, I had most of the episodes recorded, but you're going to hear it in my voice in this one and probably a couple more. But we are going to plow ahead and not delay the series because I sound good enough to record. With this year's 12 Days of Crime Line series, I tried to cover cases from around the world. And though I fell a little short of being in a different country every single episode, I did decide when I started this that I was definitely not going to cover tourists who went missing or were murdered abroad. I wanted to cover the cases of the people who lived in the countries we were discussing. This episode is the sole exception, and that's because we're talking about Antarctica. It's actually illegal to live on Antarctica full time. The Antarctic Treaty of 1961 set the continent aside for scientific research. It does not recognize or dispute any existing land claims at that point, which again, 1961, but no future land claims would ever be accepted. Mining is illegal and military activity is also illegal except for peaceful scientific research. At the time of the treaty, there was already a permanent research station that had been there since 1956. It is called the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station, named after Roald Amundsen and Robert F. Scott, who both led teams that raced to the South Pole in the early 1900s, which is when pole exploration became more popular. The scientific research station is under the jurisdiction of the United States. So that is the setting of today's case, being that it's one of the few inhabited places in Antarctica. And our case is about astrophysicist Rodney Marks. Rodney was from Victoria, Australia. From a young age, his intelligence was obvious to his parents and teachers. He went to a private, academically rigorous high school, and he went there on scholarship. He then attended the University of Melbourne, getting a bachelor's degree in astronomy before he enrolled at the University of New South Wales to get his doctorate in physics. It's not surprising that he eventually ended up doing research at the South Pole because that was a central focus of his thesis. During the warmest months on Antarctica, so we're talking November through February or March, there are around 200 people at the base. This is the safest time to be there because transportation in and out is easiest. So if there was a medical emergency or you needed extra supplies sent in, it could happen. The rest of the year, so we're talking from February or March to October at the earliest, but more like November, They consider that wintering over, and there are only around 50 people or less who do this. About 10 or so are scientists, and the rest are technicians, carpenters, there's always medical professionals, and other support staff. A large amount of supplies are delivered prior to winter starting, 
and the crew will spend seven or eight months holed up together with just these items. If there is a medical emergency, like I said, there is a doctor always on staff and medical supplies are available, but these are going to be limited. I think the most famous story to illustrate the scenario is that of Jerry Nielsen, who signed on to be the doctor at the station for a full year. During the winter months of 1998, she noticed a lump in her breast, and she attempted a biopsy herself. The results were inconclusive due to the supplies she had on hand, but her symptoms were consistent with it being cancer. It was far too dangerous to land in Antarctica in July to evacuate her, so instead they flew over and parachuted in chemotherapy drugs, which she gave to herself. Though it was risky, they sent a plane earlier than usual in October to evacuate Dr. Nielsen so that she could go get full treatment. She ended up surviving that round of cancer, though it did eventually come back and metastasize. She died in 2009. But I think the winter of 2011 really gives us our best glimpse into what they need to deal with with medical emergencies. In mid-July of that year, a communication tech came down with appendicitis. Needing surgery immediately, the station doctor operated, and the wintering scientists had to be the assistants. A month later, in August, the station manager had a stroke. While the base had basic medical and surgical supplies, they didn't have imaging equipment like an MRI, so they couldn't assess the severity of the stroke. The station doctors asked for a medevac flight, but it was deemed too risky to send a pilot in. They would basically be risking one life for another. It wasn't until nearly two full months later that the first cargo plane of the season came in, and the station manager was evacuated on that plane when it left. She was transported to Christchurch, New Zealand, and thankfully made a full recovery. So wintering there isn't the safest thing to do in the world, but Rodney Marks signed up for it in 1997. From February until at least October, there would be no one in or out and no supplies in or out. And Rodney loved it. There was little to do aside from focusing on his research and being an astrophysicist, the 24 hours of near darkness of the winter gave him plenty of night sky to enjoy even if it was very, very cold. The first round went so well that Rodney went back to Antarctica in November of 1999. He planned to stay for an entire year, leaving in November 2000, when passenger transport started up again. This gave him an opportunity to work with a specific telescope on a specific project that I'm frankly not educated enough to understand. But because of his experience having been there already and his unique blend of being both organized and creative, Rodney was the main scientist for that specific project that winter. But it wasn't all work all the time while Rodney was in Antarctica. There was downtime where those living there could socialize. Sometimes they would drink and chat, sometimes play a round of cards, and sometimes they would even have jam sessions. Rodney had a background in music, particularly as a guitarist in a couple of alt-rock bands back home, and along with some others, they formed their own group in Antarctica. One person in the band was a woman named Sonia who played bass. She and Rodney soon started dating during the summer months, which was how long Sonia had signed up to stay. But the two fell in love, so she applied to stay for the winter and was waiting to hear if it would be approved. As Sonia's February leave date was approaching, the two were already talking about marriage. Shortly before she was scheduled to head home, her application was approved, and she was going to be able to winter over with Rodney. The two were thrilled. The last transport left at the end of the brief Antarctic summer, and the staff of about 50 settled in. There was really nothing major to report until May 11th, 2000. On that day, Rodney started feeling ill as he walked from the observatory where he worked back to the station. 
He went to dinner but complained through the meal that he didn't feel good and his vision was blurry. He opted to head to bed early to get some rest. Over the next several hours, Rodney woke up repeatedly because he felt so awful. His stomach was bothering him, so he tried to take some antacids, hoping that would help. Around 5.30 in the morning, he started throwing up. There was blood in his vomit, and he felt like he was having trouble breathing, so he headed to the medical center. The doctor's notes indicate that he believed the source of Rodney's illness was a likely alcohol withdrawal, since, according to Rodney's self-report, he hadn't had any alcohol in the last day and a half, even though he was a pretty regular drinker. The recommendation was to go back to his room and try to rest until the detox symptoms stopped. He was given a sedative and sent off. Now, remember how I said supplies are dropped off for the winter in bulk? Well, one of those items is alcohol. Plenty of alcohol is left for everyone's off time, and Rodney was known to be a drinker. He sometimes drank socially to unwind, but some reports say he drank to relieve the symptoms he experienced due to having Tourette's syndrome. Tourette's is a nervous system condition that causes tics, sometimes motor, sometimes verbal, and a lot of people with Tourette's do find that alcohol can lessen those tics, and that leaves them at risk of developing an addiction. According to a Men's Journal article on this case, Rodney's Tourette's was considered mild. Rodney went back to his room with Sonia, who watched as Rodney just kept getting worse. His symptoms included blurry vision, light sensitivity, fatigue, abdominal pain, and just all over pain. With these symptoms escalating, Rodney went back to the doctor and he took some blood to run what limited tests they could do there. According to the New Zealand Herald, the doctor observed that there were two needle marks on Rodney's arm already. Rodney went back to his room to rest some more while the doctor called out on the satellite phone to consult with someone else about Rodney's symptoms. The machine that could run the blood work wasn't currently online. Sonia took Rodney back to the medical center yet again around 3 p.m. He was only getting worse. Not just his physical feeling of being sick, but also his emotional regulation. He was incredibly agitated, to the point that the doctor gave him a shot of Haldol to calm him down. And Haldol is an antipsychotic. This did help Rodney calm down, and he even laid down in the medical unit though Sonia heard him quietly moan, so she was pretty sure he was still in pain. Then Rodney started to try to sit up, and suddenly he stopped breathing. CPR was attempted, and the trauma unit came in, but after 45 minutes, they had to stop. 32-year-old Dr. Rodney Marks was dead, but no one knew of what. When his death was announced, they said they believed he died of natural causes but that wasn't based on any real information. Like I said, the machine to run his blood work wasn't working, and they didn't do an autopsy at the station. They decided to wait until they could send his body home for that to happen. Initially, they took Rodney's body to an area off the main building that was very cold, which would preserve the body until autopsy. But some people didn't think that was really appropriate. They knew they couldn't bury him permanently and put him to rest, but they could do at least something more than just store him. After gathering scrap wood from around the base, they made an oak coffin for Rodney. After a short ceremony, they lowered it into the ice outside and marked his grave with an Australian flag. And there he laid undisturbed for five months until late October when a plane was able to land and Rodney's body was taken to Christ Church, New Zealand, which is the closest major city to where they were. The station was under American jurisdiction, but the basic rule of Antarctica is that the country the person is from has jurisdiction over them as a person, which would be Australia for Rodney. But per New Zealand law, Their coroner has jurisdiction over all bodies that are in the country. It sounded like a lot of jurisdictional overlap, 
but everyone agreed for the autopsy to just be conducted in New Zealand. It took about six weeks for the results to be in because they were waiting on the toxicology report. In spite of the needle marks that had been noted, illicit drugs were ruled out. But there was something they didn't expect. They found that Rodney's cause of death was methanol poisoning. His levels were well above lethal. Methanol is also known as methyl alcohol or wood alcohol. And you know I'm going to make you indulge with me in a little history. Methanol poisoning was a major issue during Prohibition when the U.S. government made most drinking alcohol illegal. People took to drinking unregulated alcohol, commonly called bathtub gin. Bootleggers would make this bathtub gin by distilling legal industrial alcohol. That made it safe to drink. So the U.S. government started requiring that they add poisons, including wood alcohol, to industrial alcohol, which made it lethal, and it was impossible for anyone to reverse engineer the process at that point to make it safe. That did not stop people from selling the alcohol anyway, and at least 6,000 people died as a result of methanol poisoning, and many others suffered severe side effects, including blindness. When the government isn't using methanol to poison people, it is used as a solvent cleaner, and Rodney did use it to clean the equipment at the observatory. But methanol isn't toxic just because you touched it or breathed it in or cleaned with it, unless it's an extreme case. The amount in Rodney's bloodstream meant he had to have ingested some of it. But how much is some? Based on the levels in his system, it was at least 100 milliliters, but more likely closer to 150. Now, to translate that over for all my friends in America, that's like five fluid ounces or about two-thirds of a cup. So it's not like Rodney would have accidentally ingested this amount in the course of his work unless he inadvertently picked up the wrong cup and just swigged it. But you would imagine he would have noticed his mistake at some point and told the doctor that's what happened. Based on the onset of symptoms, Rodney would have ingested the methanol one to two days before his death. If we go back and think about the needle marks, we might think that that's how the methanol could have gotten into his system. It could have been injected. But then we have to ask how. There were no illicit drugs in Rodney's system, so it's not like he was an intravenous drug user who had smuggled something to Antarctica that somehow got tainted. He couldn't have accidentally injected himself and not known about it. And if someone else did it, how did they do it without him knowing? Though the needle marks have not yet been explained, it still makes more sense to me that the methanol was ingested. Obviously, this finding launched an investigation into the manner of death since it was not natural causes as first reported. They had to explore three options, suicide, accident, or homicide. The investigation was overseen by New Zealand, which I thought was interesting, jurisdictionally speaking. The station was on U.S. property, and Rodney Marks was Australian. Plus, New Zealand has made some land claims in Antarctica, and allowing them to handle the investigation could be seen as respecting that land claim by acknowledging their jurisdiction. In a lot of cases, that would have caused other countries to block this. But I imagine since Antarctica is not exactly a political hotbed that people are fighting over, Australia and the U.S. agreed to just keep the investigation with New Zealand and did not seem worried about the implications of doing so. There was honestly no precedent to determine who would investigate this as this was the first suspicious death in Antarctica. There have been other deaths that were natural causes, or accidents, except for possibly one murder. There was an incident in the 1950s at a Russian station where two scientists got into a fight over a chess game, and one attacked the other. Sources are not consistent on whether the man who was attacked died or not. 
If he did, that would be Antarctica's first murder. But this occurred before that treaty was in effect, and any investigation and the handling of that case would fall on Russia solely. And I can't find the resolution to it aside from reports that Russia banned chess playing at their station. Early on in the investigation into Rodney's death, suicide was circumstantially ruled out as Rodney was complaining about getting ill about 24 hours before his death, and he repeatedly went to the doctor for treatment. If he intentionally ingested the alcohol and then changed his mind, which does happen in suicide attempts, he would have told the doctor what he had done so they could hopefully save his life. Also, Rodney would likely have known that methanol ingestion is one of the most awful deaths that you can experience, and because of that, it is a very uncommon choice for suicide. When I tried to look up stats on this, I did find a 2018 case study about someone who did this, and it is literally titled An Unusual Case of Suicide by Methanol Ingestion. That's how uncommon it is. Suicide was deemed the least likely option, so then it was on to investigate accident or murder, which was more difficult to figure out due to the circumstances. For one thing, Rodney died in May, and it was assumed to be of natural causes, so no forensic processing of anything occurred, and no preservation of evidence happened. Not in Rodney's office, his living space, or the observatory. No one saved the cups he had been drinking out of or any scraps of food he had eaten before getting sick. It had all been cleaned several times over by the time they realized this was a matter that would need a full investigation. And another big issue was that everyone Rodney was with in Antarctica, about 49 other people, had already left. They wintered over and then went home at the end of the season and their homes were in several different countries. Interviewing witnesses was going to be difficult, but they couldn't even begin to overcome that hurdle until they got the staff list. It was requested from the U.S. by the lead investigator in New Zealand. The U.S. Department of Justice pushed all the investigative requests to the National Science Foundation and Raytheon Polar Services, as they were the two agencies that oversaw the station and handled staffing. And those agencies ignored the request. You may think maybe it was some national security thing or employee privacy law, but the investigator was able to find the names online, so clearly they weren't that private. Because of how impractical it would be to travel around the globe to interview everyone, the investigator came up with a blanket questionnaire that the National Science Foundation agreed to forward on to everyone who was on the base, but not until they approved the questions. After some back and forth, when they did eventually send the questionnaire out, the NSF made sure everyone knew that the survey was voluntary. Now, this could be seen in a bad light that the NSF was not aiding in the investigation and was throwing up roadblocks. But at the end of the day, the questions were coming from the police who were investigating a potential criminal matter, and talking to the police, whether you're being detained or not, is voluntary. So it could have simply been a matter of informing everyone of their rights. Only about a dozen people responded to the investigative questionnaire at first, and the doctor who treated Rodney was not even one of them. The lead investigator did say that he believed. Some people didn't want to cooperate because they wanted to keep open future job opportunities. They thought that participating in this investigation may be frowned upon by the National Science Foundation or Raytheon, and that would limit their future employment. Apparently, the NSF and or Raytheon did their own internal investigation and they would not turn those reports over to the New Zealand investigators. So the New Zealand investigators don't know how deeply they investigated or what they found because they were just left out of all of it. 
in the end, there was just not enough information for any manner of death to be determined. Though there is no official determination, that doesn't mean there isn't anything here for us to consider. We can start with the accident theory. Rodney was a drinker, with some people who knew him wondering if he was crossing the line into alcohol abuse. Sometimes the scientists would homebrew their own alcohol in spite of the supplies that were stocked, and Rodney would drink some of it. Though the alcohol he would have been drinking in May was gone by the time of the investigation and they couldn't test it to see if it was contaminated with methanol, no one else got sick, so it seems unlikely a communal alcohol supply was the source. If Rodney accidentally ingested methanol, it was something only he was drinking from. There was speculation that maybe he brought his own alcohol with him that he bought elsewhere, and it was impure. Three people remembered that Rodney did have a strange-shaped bottle of alcohol that he had brought back with him after a trip to New Zealand. He had a little time off before winter hit, so he had taken the time to leave Antarctica before he hunkered down for the winter. Little is known about the bottle except that it had a black and white label with possibly a shrimp on it, and it may have been in Portuguese. There is a Brazilian spirit that has a shrimp on the label called Pitu Cachaça. As far as I can tell, they don't have a black and white label, but what if there was a bootleg version and someone just slapped a cheap label that they had printed themselves? Unfortunately, like I've mentioned before, Rodney's area had been cleaned and his belongings packed up and moved, and there was no bottle found that they could test. Another thought was that Rodney's desk and workspace was cluttered and he had several bottles around. So did he really just think he was drinking regular alcohol and drank the methyl alcohol instead? It doesn't taste that much different than drinking alcohol, so maybe he didn't notice. My question would be, what were his drinking habits? Was he the type who drank spirits straight on the regular or did he tend to mix them into cocktails? So did he grab the wrong bottle when mixing the drink or is it possible someone else mixed a drink for him and that drink included a lethal dose of methanol? And that brings us to the possibility this was a murder. And if it was a murder, we have to ask who. There were the usual stresses of living with the same people day in and day out, particularly as they all still had months to go before they would get a break. One of Rodney's friends at the station, a scientist named Darren Schneider, said that Rodney had a dry sense of humor that could come out wrong to some people. But he also said that Rodney was quick to clear up those misunderstandings and make peace. It was never anything that seemed to cause any real hostility, not to the point that someone would want to kill him. There has been a theory that's been floated that possibly someone did spike his drink with the methanol, but they didn't intend to kill him. They tried to just put enough to make him sick, almost like a mean-spirited prank. As for Rodney's girlfriend, well, I mean, I guess we could probably just call her fiancé since they did plan to get married when they got back home. Things were going well for them. They were definitely still in the honeymoon phase of their relationship, and there was never any suspicion on her. What it does make me think of when I think of his girlfriend was possibly a rival here, someone who liked her and was jealous of their relationship. It may not even have been someone Rodney or Sonia were aware of. This has happened. In 2021, a Yale student named Kevin Xiong was killed about two weeks after he and his girlfriend announced their engagement. The alleged killer was friends with Kevin's fiance, and it doesn't seem like she knew that he had feelings for her. But the state alleges that he killed Kevin out of jealousy. I have to say alleged at this point because the case hasn't gone to trial, it does have some very strong evidence, and I will be covering it once it is legally resolved. From what has been made public of the investigation in this case, though, it doesn't seem like there was anyone who acted oddly towards Rodney or Sonia before his death, or at least not enough to raise any red flags. The investigation into the death of Rodney Marks ended without an answer as to what happened and why. 
And it's really sad because his father told the New Zealand Herald that, quote, I don't think we are going to try and find out any more in regards to how Rodney died. I'd see that as a fruitless exercise. Just to hear a family lose hope that they're going to get answers is heartbreaking. He did praise the New Zealand investigators while also asking why the National Science Foundation and Raytheon Polar Services wouldn't help the police investigating the case of a man who died on their watch. Even after the investigation stalled out to make sure Rodney was never forgotten, his friend Darren and others made sure that the flagpole that marked his Antarctic grave has stayed in place and they have replaced the flag as needed. As Darren told Men's Journal in 2013, the National Science Foundation did not want the flag to remain, but they've managed to keep it there anyway, along with the marker that says, Rodney Marks, friend, musician, astronomer. South Pole, 2000. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Okay, so why do people love my Total Body Bar workouts? Because they work. My clients get an amazing workout and great results. I'm Andrea Rogers, professional dancer and trainer, and my Extend Bar classes are fun. Only 30 minutes and proven to help you get sculpted, lean, and strong. And right now, you can stream my Extend Bar classes for free on the Beachbody On Demand app. See how effective these workouts truly are. Start for free today at Beachbody.com.